So I told you that when we examined the brains of the dyslexics, we made some observations that we couldn't know if they were causal or not. In order to know that something is causal, you have to create a model and you have to fiddle with a model and see what kind of an effect you have. So if we believe that the uh, neuronal migration difficulties that we saw in those dyslexic brains are causal, we, we, would, we would like to take a, a brain, introduce these, and see what we get. If we introduce these neuronal migration anomalies, we should get some sort of deficit that could explain the phonological deficit. Well, we, we don't do that in children. We, we wouldn't do that in a human brain. Uh, you can do it in a computer model, except that we don't know enough about the biology of these abnormalities to model it very well in a computer. So we do it in, in rodents. And that seems strange, because you know, what is the behavior that you're going to expect to see? You know, in, in research we have to have, in research we have to have an experimental and a control. And neither of them can read. So, um, <laughs> I got a lot of flack for this model over my career, I tell you. But I was not modeling. I was not modeling reading. As I told you, I think reading is down the line. The first step is to model auditory function, and then to model phonological representation. The same Patricia Cool had written now 40 years ago that chinchillas can represent the sound structure of English. They can actually if they hear English enough, they parse the sounds into phonemes, just like we do. They, the pro, so that's an early function that even these animals can do. What they cannot do is concatenate them. It's to mix them up together to get meaning, because this is the secret of language, is that, is that um, ability to take a limited number of sounds, combine them in different ways, and each time you combine them in a different way, you get a different meaning. Uh, you do that with, with phonemes and words and lexical items. You combine lexical items to get phrases and sentences. But you can write the Bible with 25 sounds. That's the point. The point is that that later ability that Chomsky described for us stops with a chinchilla. It doesn't go beyond. But they, they are able to, to, to process sounds of that kind, of the phonemic kind, so we thought it was okay to, to use the rat. <laughs> I had to take five minutes today to, ex to, to justify it. <laughs> but also, I wanted, we wanted to model these malformations, so we caused these malformations. These are quite identical to the ones that we found in the human brain, but we could cause them by manipulations of the animal brain during the neuronal migration, they're fairly easy to cause. So we have a normal animal, we induce this thing, we get the malformation, now what can or can they not do? So this is sort of more of a causal design. And there are a lot of things we discover. We discover that if we put a little malformation in the, cor in the cortex that looks quite dyslexic, you change the thalamus. Now, I you hear words like this during my talk. The important thing to, to know about the thalamus is at a relatively early stage of sound processing. It's before it gets to the cortex. So this, this brain, the very, very young brain, these are newborn rats, are, are very plastic. You do something in one place, it quickly spreads to other places. It's got these network properties that move very, very fast. It's plasticity, we call it plasticity. And not all plasticity is good. I will show you that this plasticity is actually bad, okay? That you induce this in the cortex, you get secondary changes in the thalamus, and you see problems with sound processing. Um, here's, for example, we're giving two, uh, two sounds to an animal, separated by a gap. When the animal does not have a malformation, you, you register the first sound electrically, and then you, depending on the width of the, of, the, of the gap, you begin to see the representation of the second sound too. If the, if the gap is too narrow, the animal is not, not able to capture the second one. But assuming a gap of 36 milliseconds, the animal is already able to 
pick up the second sound. The dyslexic rat, it's not able to do it. And you can see here that it gets the first one, but it doesn't get the second one. Meaning that you slow down the system. It takes more time to get back in shape so that it can hear the second sound. Now, you've heard before that there's, a, there's in part, dyslexic children have problems with certain phoneme combinations that occur very, very fast. Uh, the differentiation between T and D, B and P, you know, these kinds of things that differ from each other in the order of 15 to 20 milliseconds of voice onset time. Some of you may be speech pathologists. So, so, so if we have a, a model here where we lesion the cortex and what we produce is the inability to perceive sounds that occur too quickly one after the other, we have a model that we can work with. We also show here that uh, this is a map of the auditory cortex and the tonotopic representation, different tones are represented by different colors. And by introducing this little tiny malformation, we really de de degrade the map. It becomes a much poorer map. And we also change connectivity between different parts of the brain. We actually do lots of things from introducing just a tiny little thing. If you did that in a, an adult, and we did it in adult rats, nothing happens like that. It's only because very young, the animal is very plastic and reorganizes broadly from something very focal like this. What does it do to sound processing? I showed you physiologically what it does. Actually, when you, when you do behavior and you ask the rats to tell two sounds that are coming too close together or slightly farther apart, you show how in the male only, in the male only, Introducing that little malformation makes them unable to pick up the second sound. They only pick up the first. And this is behavioral testing, not physiological testing like before. The other one was like a kind of an EEG. This one is just watching the animal behave. Now, it doesn't do it to the female. And not only that, notice this, that it, the, the sham male, which is a control male, we really pretend to be doing these things to do everything except introduce the malformation. The sham male is not as good as the altered female. There's a male-female difference, fundamental difference in their ability to pick up sounds in the wild. Okay. And when we put lesions into them, the, the females couldn't care less and the males get totally deteriorated. And, <laughs> It's so, it's interesting because for a long time in developmental neurology, we thought that boys are more vulnerable to some of these things because they're bigger when they're born, they have bigger brains, have more trauma during, they're more likelihood to have more trauma during the delivery, and so they get more injured. But in this particular model, they get the same injury, the males and the females, but the Females have an adoptive way of responding to this injury, and the males do not. Not only that, we also know, and it's evil, that if we give testosterone to the females at that time and mimic some of the hormonal milieu of the male, we make them like males. They are also uh, altered in their ability to uh, process these rapidly changing sounds, meaning that, at least in part, this male-female differences is being mediated by the male sex hormone. Male sex hormones we know are bad, and they're bad throughout <laughs> life. <laughs> but as the French said, vive la différence. <laughs> so this is a, a demonstration of a male-female difference in vulnerability. We could not have learned this without having this model. We cannot necessarily extrapolate this to humans. I think there's more overlap in males and females and humans than there are in rats. We do have girl dyslexics, you know. We didn't have any girl rat dyslexics. So there is a difference. But I think it's still informative. 